Um, obviously, we're, look, we've, we're doing a lot with, with, with ODL today and, and um, also pushing into uh, RippleNet as well in the, in the coming, coming weeks and months. Uh, the thing I love about ODL at the moment is that we're sort of completely in the forefront of this. Um, as we go around and talk, I think there's a lot of skeptical people out there still. And, and you know, um, I'm here to say, I guess I was one of them and now I am not. Do you think Ripple could make a comeback? There's a lot of FX volatility in that stuff. Um, and to be able to see transactions go to, you know, for example, U.S. to Mexico, which is the biggest corridor we have right now, um, we're moving, you know, $350 transfers to Mexico literally, you know, every second, you know, sub-seconds. We're moving just and, and settling, you know, billions of dollars. And That's probably the single biggest challenge that we had, um, you know, using that was we were trying to look at cross-border um, use cases and you go from you know US dollar to a peso like we do today you got to buy pesos you have to play pesos into the market there's an FX cost to that well you think when you go into the crypto world you could eliminate the FX cost the reality is you can't because that 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 coins moving around in value so uh, you know for us I think getting US to Mexico up um, I think we're pushing almost today about 10% of our volume uh, that we normally do to Mexico through the ODL platform it's working extremely well we've now um, opened into uh, four new corridors that were um, beginning to, to scale. Uh, and I think that those will continue to ramp in the, in the coming, coming weeks and, and, and months. And, uh, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, pairing off our transaction flows with the currency flows really gives a lot of efficiency and scale to, to what we do. You know? It didn't really solve for anything. And actually, it added a, a third element because you now you're going a dollar to a currency to another currency. So now you're doing like two foreign exchange trades instead of one. Um, literally having that on-demand liquidity. So knowing how many pesos I moved, what time of day, where the peso rate was, and then be able to actually buy your pesos at that same time, land them in Mexico for the purposes of settling is really pretty phenomenal. It's pretty amazing. So it didn't really make a lot of sense to me. So. Um, uh, you know, uh, I won't comment on, you know, what else they're doing or, or where they're going to go because, you know, it's a lovely company, I guess. Yeah. Hey, hey, everybody. It's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And let's get right into it, shall we? The open intro was my new edit. That was the CEO of MoneyGram, Alex Holmes, who has flipped totally on his narrative. Now, either he wasn't being truthful when he spoke about Ripple's technology, or he's not being truthful now. I don't know which it is, but I will tell you that when he did work with the company Ripple, he was guaranteed to be compensated if there was any slippage. And MoneyGram, they did, as a company, book profits from selling XRP. But this was highly unexpected and unprofessional at the end. Just to be clear, they use USDC. That is the stablecoin that's backed one-to-one -one with the US dollar. They do not use XLM as a bridge. In this video, I want to talk about the Ripple IPO being delayed. It's not off the table, but it is not going to happen anytime soon. Also, John Deaton asked the sleuths to assemble what they could find on a woman by the name of Christina Wyatt. And I'll share with you my work. And there's a new video out with the work that Ripple has done to bring a use case to fruition with the Central Bank of Hong Kong. And here you have the market at a glance. This is the top 50 by market cap. XRP is at 62 cents, nearly 63 cents, up 13% on the seven day, 19% on the 30 day. Bitcoin, just over 35,000, up 25% on the 30 day. There's a little bit of profit taking, as you can see on Solana, but it is still up 77% on the 30 day. The biggest gainer, it is Multiverse X, up 66% on the seven day. 100% up on the 30 day. Its ticker is EGLD. This green candle pushed it to a 42% rise in the last 24 hours. It's a metaverse ecosystem, more than 500,000 followers on X. They're award winning and they have a huge loyal community of builders. I'm telling you, a loyal community of builders is everything.
let's talk about the Ripple IPO. When you hear people discussing the Ripple IPO, comparisons should be made with similar types of companies, not companies that are just because they're in the fintech sector, you compare them. No, you want to compare them to other payment companies. And if you investigate the market IPO sentiment or intent right now, one to watch is the Ripple partner Neom Global. They are holding off their US IPO to possibly the second quarter of 2025. The CEO, Prajit Nanu, said this in a Singapore interview back in June. And what's interesting is they just launched a type of liquidity hub in October for foreign exchange called Global FX. It's a new solution that has the ability to lock and hold an FX rate for up to 24 hours and settle those foreign exchange conversions on a future scheduled date. Amazing, right? It's helping businesses mitigate the risk of currency fluctuations and improve cash flow. And I kind of made the joke, maybe MoneyGram should inquire. But this is a company that is comparable to Ripple. The other company you want to watch is the Ripple partner Tranglo. They are trying to go public through the parent company company called Seamless Group. And they've extended their date to go public by six months. And that is with Infant, which is an acquisition corporation where they plan to execute this going public with a SPAC. The delay resulted in a loss of 23% uh, cash just gone out of the trust, which is a real bummer for the whole project. And that was announced in August. So you can do the research if you want, but they are also stumbling with the timing. And then you've got Warren Buffett. He has backed New Bank. This is the largest fintech bank in Latin America. They have 82 million customers and a revenue of 1.69 billion. They IPO'd on the New York Stock Exchange in December 2021. They were valued at 45 billion. So very much in the neighborhood of where I think Ripple is going to be valued at when you take into account all of their assets and that's including XRP on hand and their portfolio. And their share price opened up at $9. Now it's currently down 23% from its all time high. This crypto friendly bank also even launched its own token in March of this year. So really no wonder why investors are not excited about IPOs. The biggest IPOs of 2021, according to Crunchbase, have shed 60% of their value. And so there remains to be a considerable amount of backlog of still private unicorns attempting to go public, but just contemplating the market. And the debut will probably change when conditions improve. So when you hear about people saying you better hurry up and get the last bit of, of shares before things go public, that is just not the case. And Ripple is taking that off the table for now. Now it's not, it's going to remain on the table for the future, but they are not going to go public on a short term basis. So it is going to require some, some patience. And I'm positive that they will do what they did before and create some liquidity events for those shareholders that have to wait. And that's just the way it's going to be until we have a better idea of where the market is. Now, the last little point I want to make is when you hear someone give you their price analysis for a company valuation, and they're trying to get close to the possible share price, you must include the following essential components. You have to know what the cash balance is of that company. You need to know if they have any debt. You need to know what the value of their investment portfolio is. The total shares outstanding, fully diluted, absolutely 100%. You must know this in order to calculate correctly. And then, of course, any other value of assets that they have on hand. So everybody who's listening to this video 
can do their own valuation of Ripple with just a little bit of research. It's not difficult. And I'm sure that you will come very close to what we see happen when the timing is right for them. You may be asking yourself, how do I know it's going to be delayed? Well, uh, there's many people in the space that have seen a letter. And one of those who did see the letter was Jeremy Hogan. And he did put a post out on X regarding this. Fox Business News broke a story that the internal emails are showing the SEC has coordinated climate disclosure rules with a firm set to financially benefit. That firm is led by this woman, Christina Wyatt. She is a former SEC senior counsel for the climate and ESG, and the firm is called Persephone. They will have an absolute gold rush of clientele, basically a captive audience. The emails reveal that the SEC was developing rules behind the scenes. Now, Gensler has always said that they are neutral. Well, this proves they are not. The deep corruption is just beyond belief. Attorney John Deaton asked for help, and he said it looks like he might be filing not just one class action lawsuit, related to regulatory capture. He's not done fighting the corruption, everyone. Now, I want to share with you what I found on Christina Wyatt. And, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity to, to make money in this space, and, and the companies that do that well, I think, will really thrive. Our guest today, Christina Wyatt, is Director of Sustainability at Latham & Watkins here in Washington, D.C. Christina and I worked at the SEC way back in the day in the Division of Corporation Finance. She went on to work for an SEC commissioner. She's got her MBA in sustainability. She's a super lawyer, a super person. I'm Brock Romanek today on Zippy Point. So how do you think now you've had some time to use that degree? How do you think that degree helps you in your current role? You know, I, I think it's given me confidence in feeling that I can approach what are fundamentally very difficult challenges around ESG issues that investors and, and companies face. Um, it's not that I have all the answers by any means, but I, I have a pretty good feel for the landscape and a decent analytical toolbox to draw on. So, well, again, I don't think I have all the answers. I feel pretty well qualified to work toward the answers which is really what I think everyone in this space is trying to do. Um, and, and I absolutely credit my, my MBA experience for that. Governments around the world will require companies to be held accountable, and that's a game changer. Look, investors have been asking for a long time for information about companies' climate-related risks, because climate risk is financial risk. What the SEC's done is to come in and ask companies in a consistent way to talk about their greenhouse gas emissions and to talk about what that means for their companies. Putting all of this in public company filings with the SEC will make them accessible to investors and critically create an environment where investors have consistent and comparable information that they haven't had before now. And that's a game changer. So my advice? I would get started without delay so you can build the controls and systems you need in order to have confidence in your climate reporting. And remember, we're here to help. To learn more about the SEC climate disclosure rule, visit persephone.com slash SEC. And of course, there will be tools that are coming on board to help companies with their reporting. So, you know, I think the arguments about the cost are probably a bit overblown. Mm -hmm just as they were at the time of Sarbanes-Oxley. Right, I remember right? that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it's something that companies will be able to manage. The first year costs are likely to be higher than yeah. subsequent costs, but there are also benefits to this. I mean, these are real risks and real opportunities that companies need to be addressing. And so the, the costs that they incur in order to address those risks and opportunities 
won't be, won't be wasted in that companies will do a better job necessarily of identifying these risks, figure out a plan as to how to mitigate them, mm -hmm. and identifying opportunities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity to, to make money in this space, and, and the companies that do that well, I think, will really thrive. Hong Kong is seriously leapfrogging. Today was the last day of the week-long FinTech Summit. 35 videos. The government has embraced innovation, regulation, and the digital economy that every member of Congress in the U.S., I think, should watch. The BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, gave a keynote. The Hong Kong Monetary Authority, which is their central bank, also had a keynote. Standard Chartered was there. And it was this 30-minute panel discussion about the e-Hong Kong dollar that I want to talk about. On the panel was Hong Seng Bank, also the head of blockchain for MasterCard, the head of retail banking at ICBC, and Visa. And for Hong Kong, there is 37 trillion of this tokenization opportunity. Let's watch this clipped up version of how Ripple is bringing a solution to tokenizing real estate where you can access that liquidity for lending will follow with the portion of that panel. New opportunities, convenience, security, and empowerment, a higher efficiency for business. The vision of the future Fubon Bank, Ripple, and partners are exploring under the HKMA's eHKD pilot program. For Hong Kongers like Ying, this is what the hypothetical digital Hong Kong dollar, or eHKD, may represent. A central bank digital currency leading to accelerated and simplified traditional financial processes to speed up money flows with less resistance and cost, benefiting buyers, sellers, and the economy at large. Processes that take weeks of paperwork between third parties will be completed almost instantly in a few clicks. As part of the EHKD pilot program, Fubon Bank, Ripple, and partners have spent months developing a faster way to unlock home equity and turn it into credit through a home equity line of credit loan or HELOC loan. But you think if you are adopting a new technology, uh, the DLT, the distributed uh, ledger technologies, all these, if we come with smart, uh, smart contract, which can enforce uh, automatic fulfillment of preset condition, and all these can be done uh, effectively, uh, efficiently, and in a very short period of time. But, but I think the point I, I want to raise to highlight here is, is having all this infrastructure is the power to unleash the liquidity in the market. Now, uh, um, at present, I, uh, based on some research, uh, the total assets that is available for tokenizations is amounts to 37 trillion. And actually 20% goes to residential. Okay, but the finance home properties ratio versus the total values of properties is only 9%. So imagine if you can provide, if we can provide an innovative solution for secure lending, it is able to facilitate the general mass to unleash the liquidity more easily. And ultimately, it can help the growth of uh, economic growth of Hong Kong.